Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nuno Ferreira. I'm a professor of law at University of Sussex. And I'm Maria Federica Moscati, and I'm a leader in law and society at the University of Sussex. And we are here today together to um, uh, give, record our presentation on school uniforms and children's rights. And uh, so I, uh, uh, we have worked on this theme for a long while and actually I think that it was also the reason why we met. Uh, and so we started working on this topic uh, um, while we were both participating in the children uh, judgment project uh, during which uh, several academics, scholars from different parts of the world were called together to rewrite uh, judgments concer concerning children. We decided to write the to rewrite the judgment concerning Shabina Begum and her struggle to wear the shibab. And we can okay. Uh, now a bit of the I will I wish to give you a bit of the con context about the case. Uh, Shabina Begum, who is the lady portrayed in this slide, uh, was uh, uh, attending uh, the Denbing High School in 2000, and she was um, 11. At that time, the school uniform um, uh, required the students to wear the shalwar kameze and headscarf. And Shabina, for two years, decided to follow the rules of the school uniform. But then, after uh, 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 two years, she decided, she went to school with her uh, brother and another friend and asked to wear the jibab, a long coat-like garment. Um, and the, so the brother and the, uh, his friend requested that Begum, that Shabina, uh, would be allowed to attend the school wearing the shibab and not the prescribed um, school um, uniform. Um, the school was the opinion that uh, the shabina had to abide to the rules and wear the the other the the the, the school uniform. And also, the school pointed out that their policy and guidance on uniform were actually in line with the then Department of for Education and Skills guidance. And we will touch on these later on and to see how Shabina in her struggle had an impact on the this uh, uh, um, guidance uh, uh, too. Uh, and uh, um, so once the school uh, suggested Sabina to go back home, she uh, 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 applied um, for, she initiated a judicial review uh, of the school um, uniform. And this was the beginning of li literally a judicial uh, saga um, with also the um, uh, debate that it um, it brought. And I can think of that. No, sorry. Okay, now, the uh, First of all, Shabina claimed her, uh, that uh, her freedom of religion protected under Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights and her, her right to education protected under Article 2 of the first protocol to the, you know, the, the European Convention on Human Rights had been violated by the school sending her home and asking her to wear the school uh, uniform. Now, she was not su successful in the High Court, but then uh, the, uh, she was successful in the Court of Appeal, and then at the end, the dispute arrived at the uh, uh, House of Lords. And here we come in, because we rewrote the, the judgment of the House of Lords. The, the House of Lord. um, and so the, the, the uh, question 
questions that the House of Lords had to uh, answer and to address were, first of all, if the uh, whether the Shabina was excluded by from the school, if she if there was an interference with the Shabina's freedom of religion art, under Article Nine of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, and if so, whether this interference was justified. And then the third question was whether Shabina's right to education was infringed as a result of her being uh, deemed to have been excluded from uh, school. Essentially, the uh, during the uh, so the House of Lords actually, uh, uh, so the, the, the main argument for the House of Lords to come to the conclusion that actually uh, that uh, interference was justified was based on the three main arguments, the contracting out doctrine, namely that Shabina and her parents, when they decided to choose that school, they knew what the rules were, and so therefore, once she didn't uh, uh, agree with the rules, she and decided not to follow the rules, she actually decided to uh, uh, um, contract out the, the and, you know, to, to leave, not to adhere to the rules, it was her choice. Then the other point, the other argument was whether Wearing the, so the the wearing the shiab would actually jibab would actually affect the rights of the other students pupils in the school. And then what was questioned was the Shabina's decisional autonomy and whether she made the decision to uh, 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 to wear the the uh, jibab uh, autonomously or encouraged by her family. Now, we looked at, sorry, we looked at this uh, um, decision and we wrote the judgment drawing upon the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also on the interviews that we both carried out with Shabina and her barrister. Uh, and actually, we came to the conclusion that uh, Shabina was indeed excluded by the school and this exclusion was not justified. And we have, and I would like to quote here uh, from the interviews we interview with uh, um, Shabina, who, by the way, when we interviewed her, was already a grown-up, uh, wonderful lady with children and running her own clothing um, business. Um, and in particular, so I would like to quote something from the interview, in particular con regarding the contracting out doctrine and the possibility that uh, apparently Shabina had to choose other schools. She says that once I lost my case in the High Court, the local education authority helped me to get into a school which was very far from my house. It used to take me one hour and 20 minutes to get there by bus, and that school was a very underachieved school. So, although it might be possible, it may be there were other schools, still the school and then the judges didn't seem to take into account that the difficulties of choosing another school would bring. Then the other aspect is the effect on Shabina, on the other children. And now, the uh, uh, in doing that, in saying that, the school, in our view, struck a dangerous balance between the individual rights of one child, Shabina, and the rights of other pupils. And the school did so on the basis of pure assumptions, because apparently the student, the other pupils, were not consulted about the several decisions that 
concerned these disputes. And then this is the point that I think is most important, the challenging or questioning the Begum's decision, decisional autonomy. During the interview I had with uh, Sharbina, she explained me that the decision to wear the jibab was her own decision. It's a decision that uh, she made following uh, her own study of the Qur'an. Actually, her sister kept wearing the school uniform and her family were not, were very, very worried for her decision. So she needed, of course, the brother because she needed an adult to talk with the, the uh, QC and so on. So, and I think that this is the key point because still it seems to me that it's very difficult to accept that a child, in our case, Shabina and a girl, uh, uh, can make an independent, informed, autonomous decision regarding her religion and also and how to exercise her religion. Shabina was not influenced by nobody, but was her decision. Of course, maybe she changed her mind because at the beginning when she started to attend the school, she was actually wearing the school uniform, but she was an adolescent, so it's normal for adolescents to change their mind. And actually, let's say that changing mind regarding some specific, some important choice of life is also protected by Article 5 of the UN uh, the United Convention on the Rights um, of uh, uh, the Child. There is also that other aspect of this case that put a big question mark on the involvement of children during the proceedings, but also on the involvement of children in decisional pro uh, uh, decisional moments concerning uh, their life. Okay, and now I think that we can move to the other slide. There is a lot to say, but uh, uh, um, now, the, the Shabina's case actually created academic debate, but also had an impact on the guidance of Department of Education guidance on the school uniforms, as I said uh, at the beginning of this pre presentation, because of following the case, the uh, guidance were uh, changed, and so explicit reference uh, is included in the guidance for schools to to involve parents and children when deciding how to design the uniform. Also, uh, express reference is made to the Equality Act 2010. However, I would say that there is still something which, in my view, needs to need more careful consideration by the Department for Education because this guidance in the, in the section concerning the possibility to challenge the, the, the uh, school uniform or to put forward a complaint actually do not say anything about the involvement of children regarding this. Now, the Shabina case, of course, is not isolated. Other countries have, uh, 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 have experienced uh, um, uh, uh, examples of children challenging uh, the school uniforms, and some of these challenges reached the European Court of Human Rights. Here we have two examples. One uh, uh, brought by the Dokru versus France by the uh, a child uh, um, 
in France and the other one in Switzerland, but in both cases uh, the result was that the uh, children were not successful in their uh, uh, requests, in their um, endeavour. And here and now we can move to uh, uh, examples in of uh, um, other examples in which the uh, schools in France but also in London have tried to have uh, have considered whether to change their uh, uh, policies uh, and their internal school u school uniform policies concerning some uh, some uh, uh, um, piece of clothes. So, for example, in London, in a London school, there is under review a ban on the niqab uh, 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 to be uh, from being worn on their premises, and. Uh, uh, um, in a school actually in London where there was an original ban on wearing this niqab but then it's under review and so under review or no under review is also the, 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 again that an initial uh, limitation of children expression through clothes and through school uniform um, where uh, again in a school uh, in London again a school uh, had threatened the parents of a school girl with legal action after the the uh, uh, the uh, pupil went to school wearing a skirt which apparently was too long uh, but then the uh, 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 and the child felt also bullied for her religious belief but then the school decided to drop the legal action then moving to uh, uh, other uh, religions we can see that it seems that it could be also the other way, and so that schools uh, open uh, or uh, seem to be open to listen more to the voice of the child, and see such example examples have included, for example, a. Uh, uh, um, the allowing a Rastafarian boy to actually uh, uh, wear the dreadlocks, or in or a. Um, uh, uh, another uh, school in Pennsylvania to allow uh, children to have also the uh, wear, wear uh, t-shirts or other clothes uh, um, with, sat with satanic um, uh, uh, symbols, I think. And so now I hand over to Nuno. Thank you, Marika. So, um, so far we've seen several examples of how religion interacts with school dress codes, uh, and now we're going to start exploring how other protected characteristics and individual characteristics can also interact with school dress codes. So besides re religion and religious beliefs, we also have uh, the case of ethnicity, interacting with school dress codes, in particular uh, certain ethnic uh, aspects of um, individuals, uh, including hair, uh, affecting uh, or interacting negatively with dress codes and dress codes um, having a negative impact on ethnic identities. So in this slide we have several examples, uh, especially from US schools, um, where uh, some students had problems uh, with school dress codes because of their hair, which was connected with their ethnic identity. So there is a strong movement in the US to uh, include um, hair within uh, the protected characteristic of ethnicity uh, and prohibit discrimination on grounds of hair uh, to make sure that uh, students from ethnic minorities are not uh, negatively affected because of the hair they use. Um, then uh, there's also uh, gender as a very relevant uh, aspect of individual identity, um, in, which also uh, sometimes conflicts with some school dress codes. Uh, that's uh, generally in relation to female pupils, 
So in this uh, slide, we've got a couple of examples, both from uh, New Zealand and uh, from um, from the UK, where and the US, um, where um, girls have protested against uh, the um, uh, the school dress code because of the negative impact it had on their freedom to wear. Uh, um, the clothes they wished, in particular, um, the the length of their skirts. But also, uh, interestingly, um, gender interacts with school dress codes um, with a negative impact for boys as well. So uh, we found a couple of examples of boys also being negatively affected by school dress codes, in particular because of the length of the hair. Again, examples from uh, the US and uh, from the UK, uh, where boys uh, have been asked to um, uh, cut their hair because of the way uh, it was in conflict with, uh, their, um, with the school dress codes. So we've talked about uh, uh, religion, ethnicity, uh, gender. Um, so these are all individual characteristics that affect the way children can wear uh, their clothes at school. But interestingly, even parents sometimes are affected by school dress codes, not only pupils. So we've come across an example of a Jewish school in the UK, in the London area, uh, being um, uh, or adopting a, a school dress code that affected uh, the parents as well. Uh, so it was um, a very interesting illustration of how uh, even the broader family can become uh, embroiled in these debates uh, about school dress codes. So having considered all these, we would like to now take a, a moment to consider why are dress codes so important? Why are we uh, so keen or why are some schools so keen uh, in retaining dress codes? So uh, if we take a look at an example from, the, from a school in the southeast of England, we uh, can say that um, reasons invoked to retain a school dress code relate to the safety of the pupils, uh, preparing them for the future, offering families value for money in the sense that it's cheaper to have a school uniform than having to buy other clothes, also ensuring that the pupils are ready for work, um, uh, providing them a sense of pride uh, for the, uh, attending a certain school and uh, also uh, making them feel part of a student community and uh, avoiding social inequality uh, because uh, dress codes would remove certain symbols and certain brands uh, and so that would help uh, students feel more part of the, of the community. But on the other hand, we also come across uh, several arguments against school dress codes. And so using the same example from the same school uh, in the southeast of England, uh, we've um, heard uh, from students um, complaining about dress codes because uh, they find the controls that come with the imposition of dress codes quite demeaning and embarrassing. Um, they uh, complain that the school environment becomes unsafe and scary because of teachers uh, uh, trying to control the um, uh, school uniform um, uh, abidance. Um, we also heard uh, female students complaining that they feel objectified and sexualized, especially in relation to the control of skirts. Uh, there's also a negative impact on the right to education because if there's a violation of the school dress code, uh, that can lead to detention and even internal exclusion. So uh, students end up missing out on uh, classes. And more broadly, there's um, a negative impact on mental health and ment emotional well-being because students are uh, concerned uh, and uh, feel stress for uh, having to abide to a certain dress code and uh, they cannot express themselves um, uh, and benefit from uh, the right to freedom of expression as much as some would uh, wish. Um, finally, some uniforms are also found uncomfortable. So considering both arguments in favor and against school uniforms and um, bearing in mind that we adopt a children's rights perspective, uh, we would like to put forward um, as a sort of conclusion to our presentation a convention on the rights of the child reading to these debates. And if we look at these debates from a convention on the rights of the child perspective, we would uh, advocate in uh, favor of greater autonomy and self-determination. Uh, children should have a greater saying um, through their right to participation 
um, a greater saying into uh, what that policy looks like, uh, so they should be better consulted and be part of the processes that lead to uh, an adoption of a, a dress code. We should also make more room for uh, adjusting um, certain policies to um, certain individual requirements uh, that can uh, help children um, not feel discriminated and see their individual characteristics respected by uh, schools policies. Uh, we we'll also advocate for greater substantive equality. So rather than policies applying uh, in exactly the same way to all the children without any consideration for how they may impact different children uh, to different extents, we would advocate for greater substantive equality. So uh, schools need to uh, be aware of how uh, certain rules may impact on uh, different children with different characteristics in different ways. So um, schools should strive for greater substantive equality. Uh, finally, uh, uh, children's uh, rights perspective uh, should also enhance the agency of children in this whole process. Uh, and this is not to say that the schools should not be allowed to have um, dress codes. There could still be uh, a minimum baseline that uh, schools could try to adhere to. Uh, but um, be beyond that baseline, there should be greater um, scope for children to have more saying on the actual policy and uh, see their individual characteristics respected and accommodated within that policy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.